the truth that it says. We were destined for the grave. Hmm, but God pulled us out. Amen? Hmm, thank you, God.
cities, in our state, God, in our country. We pray, we pray, we pray. Come illuminate the darkness with your light, God, with your light. Church, unified under you. 
as it is in heaven. Church, would we let the Father come and work in our hearts? I just keep hearing about his kingdom, but I kept hearing in us. It's got to be in us. It's got to start in us, in our hearts. first part of that song, and I want to sing it again, but it talks about as we contend for another move, and I, I just get this sense that when we, we're, we're here and we're contending. First of all, are we here this morning contending? Are we here going, Lord, we want you to come. We want another move of your spirit. As I think about that word contend, that, that falls on us. 
Like that word is we have to contend. We have to get on our knees. We have to get on our face. If we want to see another move of God. I don't know if you had a chance to watch the stuff in D.C. yesterday. I watched a small portion of it. It was amazing. But for the first time in a long time, I didn't feel alone or just in this community. I hear the way the vice president was speaking and the, the scripture that he was saying, I felt so clearly to me that he believed that, he knew that scripture. And he talked about if my people will humble themselves, right? If they will humble themselves and pray, he will heal their land. And he said that and I believed he meant that. But we've got to contend, church. And so I want to go back into the first part of that song as Christy leads us. Think about what that may mean for you in this season. What does content look like? If we want to see a move of the Holy Spirit, we want to see things shift, we want to see atmospheres change, we want to see a country revitalize and, and, and turn the roots back to the roots where it was founded on the foundations of Christianity. If we want to see that, it takes us. We've got to contend in our own hearts. So Father, we ask that you just come. God, reveal stuff to us that we need to, to work on. But Father, help us. Help us to say we, we are contending for another move. We put all of our stuff aside and we're seeking you and your face, God. Father, we want you to come. We want another move of your spirit to break out, God. We contend. So let's sing that together, church. We contend. We contend. Father, we ask that you would come. You come and you move, Father. We are standing here saying, Father, we want you to have your way with us. Have your way in this community. Have your way in this state. Have your way in this country, God. Have your way, Father. But as believers, Father, we are going to stand and contend and say, this land belongs to you. Thank you, Jesus. My heart, Father, our hearts belong to you. So God, as we continue throughout this service, would you speak to us? Would you reveal stuff to us? God, Holy Spirit, come and speak. Speak through worship. Speak through the preachers, the message. So Father, we thank you. We love you. We praise your name, God. We say we love you. We worship you. We bow down to you, Father. We are standing in the gap saying we are going to contend in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome to New Life. We are glad you guys are here. You can grab a seat. Please welcome Pastor Heather. Good morning, church. We want to welcome all of our first and second time guests. If you are visiting with us for the first time, there's a card in the pocket behind you or in front of you. Um, would you take this and fill this out and drop it off in our offering boxes that are on both sides of the tent? Um, also, if, oh, sorry, no, don't take it there. 
take it to the tent, our welcome tent, and then we have a gift certificate for you. I forgot about that. We want to meet you. Um, but we also have prayer and praise cards as well. They're blue. They look like this. And if you can drop those off in the um, boxes on both sides of the entrance, we also have a tab online so you can fill this out as well so we can pray and celebrate with you when the Lord is doing miracles. Uh, don't forget there's water as well for you um, throughout the service. If you need a water on both sides of the tent, um, please feel free to come and grab a water. So we have, um, we're celebrating um, a very, today is a very special day. We're celebrating our senior pastor's birthday. Um, so that'll happen in just a little bit. Um, but I want to make sure that you guys are aware that um, as you exit today, we're, um, we have ice cream for you. So make sure that you grab a, a drumstick ice cream as you exit. But um, Pastor Jason's going to kick that off in just a little bit. So something for you to look forward to. Um, okay, some of our announcements we want to make sure you guys are all aware of. Um, one basic housekeeping thing we're going to ask is please make sure that no one is parking over at the care center um, to the west side here. We have um, partnered with the Dollar Tree on the east side. So if you happen to get here a little bit later and the parking lot's all full, please make sure that you are not parking on the care center side. want to make sure that you guys are aware of that. To all of our identity class graduates, we, um, we have our second class coming up, our healing class. So this is um, the second. It is happening on Tuesday, October 20th, but you can go online right now and register for that. We are also in our 40 days of prayer and fasting. I think we're in day three. Day three, yes. So um, thank you guys for praying and interceding for our nation. We have some key points. Some of you have asked me what specifically are we praying for during these 40 days of prayer and fasting. So that is on our website, three specific things. And one of the core of it is for our nation. This is a critical time. And we as Christians need to be warfaring that we may not have two righteous candidates before our eyes, but... There is an assignment for one of them to have a listening ear for this nation, a listening ear to heaven. And so we need to pray that the Lord opens up the ears of the one that is assigned and he will lead. He can lead through unrighteous people. We see that through all of the Old Testament and the wicked kings, he was able to lead through them. And so our nation is not lost, but we have to pray. During these 40 days of prayer and fasting, um, we created three opportunities, uh, three extended opportunities for you to bring your friends and come and be part of freedom, salvation, healing. So we have set aside three nights in October, the 7th through the 9th. It's a Wednesday night through a Friday night. So please come. And you're going to hear some powerful testimonies. Um, Caleb Quay, who is preaching today, will also be sharing his testimony then. And then we have um, Caleb Brown and then Pastor Craig leading. It's going to be an incredible three nights. We want to make sure you join us then. Let's watch a quick video clip on um, what that's going to look like. This year, we've been surrounded by messages of despair, hopelessness, division, and darkness. But what if there's more than this? What if there's hope? Join us for three nights of more, October 7th to 9th, 7 to 9 p.m. Seek hope. Come find more. So there's more information um, on our website for that. So please join us for those three special nights. Okay, it is time to give. We have three um, ways of giving online through a text to give, um, or we again have those boxes as you enter and exit. So naturally, um, we, all, we all, most of us, know the story of Mary when she 
poured the alabaster oil of perfume all over Jesus before he was um, crucified and buried. And we, we can just assume the controversy that went on during that time. And we know of, you know, Judas rising up and just completely condemning the act in anger to what had been done. But I love John 12, 7. Jesus speaks up and says, it was intended that Mary should save this perfume for the day of my burial. If you think about it, wherever that perfume came from, whether it was given to her from her family line, whether she worked for it, whether it was something that was um, just stored and set aside as a treasure. I love that Jesus had an assignment on that. She wouldn't have known what that was for. She would have just known that it was something really special that was in her house that she was just not supposed to use and it was really expensive. But there was an assignment on that perfume. And that's exactly what tithing is. There's an assignment on your first 10% of your income. An assignment. The Lord has anointed and set that 10% apart for his kingdom. And when we honor that act, even though others in the world may rise up against and say that's stupid, you're wasteful, can't believe that you're doing that, the Lord will honor and bless that act and you will physically see that come back on earth. He promises that. So I want to encourage you to talk to the Lord about that. His goodness is waiting to pour out to you, but it's an act of sacrifice, just like Mary did. Heavenly Father, we, um, we, we stop and we pause and we, we take time, Lord, to honor this um, sacrifice. Lord, you modeled it all throughout earth. You modeled it on, on the death of, on the cross. We stop and we surrender to you. And we thank you, God, that we can honor you through our tithes and offerings. We thank you that you know every need that you have, that we have, Lord, and that you promise to take care of those needs for us as we seek you first. So I ask God that you would multiply and bless every sacrificial gift that's given today. And we thank you for the miracle of abundance that's breaking out in homes today because of, of their faithfulness. And so have your way, Heavenly Father. We thank you for the fragrance that sacrifices to you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Before, um, before I call up um, Pastor Jason, I just I wanted to take a moment myself um, before I hand off the mic just to um, say a few words towards um, our senior pastor, Pastor Craig. So um, he, I've, I literally calculated it. Minus maybe 10 days a year. I think we've worked about 2,307 days together. Um, that's what full time does to you. That's meetings and phone calls. Um, he empowers me to operate in my strengths. He is full of grace and full of forgiveness. He challenges my thinking and my belief systems. He accepts my faults and graciously tolerates my drama. He is humble. He's a safe person to openly share when you're just frustrated. He genuinely cares for people. You pray and you fast and you get down on your knees to hear the voice of the Lord. And more than anything, thank you for modeling the Father's heart here on earth for those of us who didn't grow up with a close earthly father. So thank you. I love you. Happy birthday, Jason. Oh, we have a video. Sorry, we're going to kick it off with um, a happy birthday video for Pastor Craig. Happy 60th birthday, PC. I love you so much. 
Thank you for building the kingdom and investing yourself. And just what you have done is so amazing. And I want to just take time and say that I honor you, I love you, and I celebrate you. Happy birthday, Pastor Craig. Can you believe you have endured me for six and a half years? Thank you for being a leader who leads with humility, power, and grace. You empower us as leaders. And we're so honored to trail behind you as you take us into this next season. Thank you. Happy birthday. We're so proud of who you are. Hi, Craig. It is such a great joy, pleasure, privilege to greet a dear friend of mine. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, PC. Um, I hope you have an amazing day and a blessed year ahead. Happy birthday, big guy. You deserve this and more. We are here because of you, the things that you have uh, taught us and leading us to do the best we can. And because of you, we are who we are now. We love you, and like Barbara would say, there's nothing you can do about it. That's right, old man. Old oh, man, I got the gray hair, you got none. Too bad. Bye. Happy birthday, Craig. It's your 60th birthday. I just want to encourage you to let you understand it's all downhill from here. Dude, there's no more walking up here. You have made it. You are 60. You're amazing, Craig. I love you so much. Happy birthday. Well, hello, hello Pastor, Pastor Craig. Craig. Happy birthday. We were just doing some light reading here and reflecting yes. on how much we love you and we're <laughs> so excited for you and wish you a happy birthday. Yes, so thank you for being you and for, I mean, literally walking us through this kind of stuff and just, you know, showing us your heart in every season. We're so thankful we can serve under you and we love you so much. And we're so excited for your 60 years. 60 years. 60 years. We, we love you, Craig. We've been with you for a good percentage of that. So just remember <laughs> that, okay? <laughs> we love you. We love you. Happy, Happy birthday. birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Pastor Craig or PC or whatever your name is. Happy, Happy birthday to you. The Happy one birthday. And only time you'll see or hear him singing, right? Only for you, my friend. <laughs> Although 60, are you going to be able to hear it? If I need to turn the volume up, are you going to be okay? Six decades. 60. Ooh. He's my pastor. I have to call him my friend too. I don't know if I have friends that old. We love you. You are awesome. Yes. Thank you. I told Leah earlier, I said thank you for ruining my life, but in a really good way. I would not know the man Jesus as well as I do if it wasn't for you. So I thank you for all you've poured into me, into my life. I know we joke around a lot, but um, I also appreciate so much that you've done for me, my wife, uh, my daughter, and how you've loved us so well and just care for us um, like Jesus did. I think of our lifespan, you know, being here for over 20 years, and um, there's some, there's been some really rocky, traumatic things that we've gone through, and you were there every step of the way. So thank you um, for walking with us and going above and beyond being a friend and a mentor. And I think of our lives spiritually. If we did not have you in our lives, I know that we would not be to the depths to the depth that we are today if we had not been here under your leadership. And so we honor you and we celebrate you and we love you so much. So happy birthday. We happy love birthday. you. And thank God for over 20 years ago that we found new life in a phone book. Amen. Most kids don't even know what that is anymore. So we love you. Happy birthday. 60 years old. Happy birthday. Would you guys stand with me? Yeah. Pastor Craig, would you come on up? <laughs> Let's give him a hand. Let's give him a hand. Now, today, today's not his actual birthday. Wednesday is his actual birthday. So if you forgot a gift, you have till Wednesday. Uh, Pro V1 Titleist golf balls. He's getting older. He needs a little more, a few more golf balls these days. So just drop him off at the church. We'll make sure he gets them. So uh, I know it'll come back around and get me at some point. So.
But let's uh, let's sing happy birthday, shall we? Christy? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Pastor Craig. You stretch your hands toward our pastor. Jesus, I thank you for this man of God. For a man who just seeks after you and has impacted so many lives, Father. I thank you just for his life and, and his commitment to you and to this body and this church. Thank you for his beautiful family. God, just the blessing the Lawrences are to us. But I thank you for Pastor Craig and his, we have to celebrate him and his birthday today. Would you just bless him, Father? Just bless him today. Bless him this whole week, this whole month. Just be, make it an awesome time, you and him. And just he would just get new revelation and new insight from you, God. You would just download on him. I know that would be an amazing birthday present for him. So, Father, just bless him. Thank you for this wonderful man. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give him another hand. Well, you guys could sit down and thank you guys, all of you, so, so much. I bless all of you. Thank you, except Jason, because he said I'm 60 like six times in that video. I will kill him later. Um, today, we have an amazing treat. Um, a friend of mine who... God just supernaturally planted here amazingly a few months ago. Never knew that was going to happen. Uh, I met Caleb Quay, I think, in 1997, Portland, Oregon. I was speaking at a national youth convention for our Foursquare family. I was actually the new district youth guy up north. I was the first district youth guy that didn't graduate Foursquare Bible College. And so uh, our national leader asked me to speak, and I was freaking out. Because they didn't tell me, like, the president of the denomination and all the leaders were going to be sitting on the front row. I was like, holy crap. And Caleb was leading worship. And uh, he's the only guy that I know, and this probably happens other places, but he's the only guy I know that when he starts playing his guitar, it starts to prophesy. And if you sit around here any length of time, you will hear the voice of the Lord as he starts playing that gift. I think it's kind of like David when he would play. The, the spirit of the Lord just moves and speaks. And so I was like crazy nervous, like totally nervous. And the Lord told me two different things. One is if you're going to activate the the leader asked me to activate people in the prophetic, to teach and activate. And, and I said, well, if we're going to do it, I feel like the leaders are supposed to do it first. <laughs> and so I was up there spitting cotton because I was so nervous about how this is going to work. And God starts downloading a word for Caleb. And I'm like, like, hey, God, I'll get to that later. <laughs> like, I'm dying up here right now. Can we just, and he's like, no, I, I want you to pray over him. And I'm like, I'll, I'll try to catch him later. And he said, right now. And I'm like, oh my gosh, there's like a thousand people in the room. So I'm all, okay, is Caleb Quay here? And it was quiet. And I thought, yes. <laughs> he slipped out the back. This is great. And all of a sudden from the back of the auditorium, I hear, oh, I'm right here. <laughs> You'll see why I gave it that accent in a minute. And he comes up, and I don't remember all that the Lord spoke, but just prayed and prophesied over him. And I'm truly just so nervous thinking, oh, my gosh, this is crazy. This guy's going to think I'm a nut job. And then he looks at me, and he goes, give me that mic. And I thought, oh. <laughs> my worst fear has come upon me. He's going to grab the mic and go, this guy's crazy. Why would you let him speak? And he just confirmed that people in the UK it had been inviting. Part of the word was you'll be going back to the UK, but not just as a worship leader, but as a prophet of God to speak life and bring revival back to the nation that you come from. And so 
Um, we are in for a major treat. Caleb has served our Foursquare family for decades. He was our national uh, worship leader for five years. Um, he's literally traveled the world. He trains and teaches people the heart of worship, not just the skill of worship. Did you hear what I just said? You guys know there's a big difference in the heart of worship and the skill of worship. Amen. He's truly the most skilled guitarist that I know, but he actually has the heart of the Father. And God has just sent him to be part of this house. And, and I'm going to ask if you guys would just stand one more time and give my dear friend Caleb Quay a giant hand as he comes to share the word this morning. Thank you, brother. Love you, man. Thank you so, much. so stretch your hands towards my friend. Jesus, bless him. <laughs> Lord, we are beyond blessed to have this man here. His crazy story, I don't know how much he'll share this morning, but amazing where you've brought him from, what he has said yes to. Lord, let it be real in our hearts that if we say yes, you'll do the same thing because you always respond to our yes. Bless him. Thank you for him. And Lord, let us just hear your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give Caleb one more giant hand, you guys. Thank you. Praise God. Please be seated. Boy, oh boy. And... <clears throat> Yeah, he already mentioned it, but just to make it crystal clear, in case you were wondering, yes, it's true, I do have an accent, and I'm so glad that you like it, because it's the only one I've got. <laughs> just wanted to level that one right there. <laughs> well, what a joy. Yeah, the Lord just planted me here, me and my wife, she's around here somewhere, she greeted most of you as you came in. But he planted us here about six months ago now, right before COVID, right before the shutdown. So it was like, boom, you're here. It was confirmed prophetically, especially by Caleb Brown and, and Pastor Craig. And it was just, I was just asked to come and help out the worship team, so, which I, I love being part of the worship team. But God had other plans, wanted us to be here. So thank you that, that I'm here. And I'm amazed that that uh, this is my first time preaching here. They put the balloons right over where I sit. I, that's a prophetic sign to me. No, I don't want to steal anything from my brother's birthday. So here's a word of the Lord, and um, there's scriptures up there, and I do apologize for a ton of scriptures because I've been sitting on this word for five months. For five months. So I'm going to do my best to blaze through it. What was that? A balloon. Another prophetic balloon. Okay. <clears throat> that was actually a sign that if I go on too long, your crockpots are going to be exploding back home. Okay. But I'll do my best to uh, just blaze through this. But it's a deep word. It's a beautiful word. Uh, the main text is Isaiah 43, 18. And the way this is going to go, it's going to go good news, some bad news, and then really great news. Does that sound like a, a meal that you can digest today? So here's the word. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Everybody say, I will do a new thing. That's the title of this message, a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. If you're taking any notes, there's three words I would encourage you to, to write down. These three words are remembrance, ownership, and partnership. Remembrance, ownership, and partnership. I want to announce to you the new thing has already begun. Let me ask you this. During the quarantine time, that your Bible reading has gotten richer God is showing you new things in Scripture. And I'm talking about passages that you've read thousands of times, and all of a sudden, there's new, they're being re-illuminated, freshly illuminated. You're having more aha moments in the Word of God than you've had for a long time. Can I see some hands? Right. The new thing is, God is making His people turning us into new wineskins. 
That's what's going on because what he wants to do and he's going to do because he's never changed his mind about building his church, he's getting ready to pour out his spirit in a, in a fresh way upon the earth. He's never changed his mind. I want to give some good news to some people and just in case you're wondering, God has never changed his mind about you. Yeah, it went quiet. Yeah, I could see. You're going to have to redo the identity class again. It's okay. He has never, ever changed his mind about you. And that goes all the way back to Genesis 1 when he created you and I in Adam and he said, this is very good. This is very good. That's where it begins. So it says, do not remember the former things nor consider the things of old. What are these things of old? These things of old, and and if you look in the text, prior to that verse, God rehearses with them their captivity in Babylon and also their deliverance from Egypt. And what he's talking about is he doesn't want us to look in the rear view mirror of our lives and be constantly taking notice of the things that once held us in bondage or captivity. He says, don't remember it. Don't consider it. Consider means to think carefully about, especially with regard to taking some action. And oftentimes we think, you know what, that thing, I'm going to fix it. And it's not for us to fix it. It's his delight to fix it. It's his delight to fix it. Some of us have suffered some things so badly that, you know, It's just too heavy. Well, heavy belongs to God because part of his character is the ox, the burden bearer. And also, you know, um, seeing as this series is to do with responding to crisis, did you know that some of the greatest promises, some of the greatest stuff that God has to say in his word about you and I were said and prophesied in the midst of crisis. So we're going to look at some crisis here from the word of God and see, look, check out God's perspective on it. The former things were the bad or difficult times or things that held you in bondage. The new thing has already sprung forth but you cannot know it by looking in the rearview mirror of your life. Did you get that? God said it's already sprung forth. God has an incredible habit of speaking in the past tense. He speaks in the past. Why does he do that? Because in his mind, it's already been done. It's already finished. Isn't that the words Jesus said when he hung on the cross? It is what? Finished. Paul says this in Philippians 3 concerning the rearview mirror. Philippians 3, 8 and 13. But what things were gained to me, these I've counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. That's a good English word, rubbish. You guys say trash, we say rubbish. They count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Verse 13, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Forgetting those things that are behind, reaching forward to those things that are ahead. But Jesus has for us. Let me say, I want to give you a very simple uh, illustration about the rearview mirror. Paul says we see through a glass darkly. Repentance is a 180 degree turn, correct? Our rearview mirror is 180 degrees, right? We're living in sin, we repent, we turn 180 degrees, we go back to Jesus, okay? God has a rearview mirror. It's completely different to ours. His rearview mirror is 360 degrees, It goes something like this. Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when he speaks to you and I, he speaks in the past tense because it's already done. 
Isaiah 40 speaks about God who lives outside of the circle of the earth, which means he's not trapped by our 24-hour clock, our 365 days a year. He don't have anything to do with our rearview mirror. His is 360 for all eternity, which for God, everything is done and it is now and done now. This is why Jesus was able to say, if there's two or more agreed as touching anything on earth, it is done by my Father in heaven. That's one of the greatest promises I know. That's why I love to pray for people. I love to pray for people based on that promise. You got a problem? Let's give it over to the Father now. Let's be in agreement now because Jesus said, it is done now by my Father in heaven. You may say, well, there's a bit of a process involved. Don't matter. The process begins now. Now. In G- Whoops. In Jesus' name. I enjoyed that trip. <laughs> oh, boy. In verse 43 of this text, he says, This people I have formed for myself. This is Isaiah 43, 21. This people I formed for myself. They shall declare my praise. For 15 years, I was doing an itinerant ministry. For 15 years, I'd be in a different church, in a different city, pretty much every week, ministering. And oftentimes, the Lord would say, research the name of this particular city. On the day that you texted me and asked me to, to, to preach here, two hours before you texted me, the Lord said to me, look up the meaning of Pomona. Are you ready for this? The name Pomona literally means, Pomona is the Roman goddess of fruit trees. Did you know that? The Roman goddess of fruit trees. That's what Pomona means. The Word of God says, This people I formed for myself, they should declare my praise. In Isaiah 61, verse 3, from verse 3 on, it's the last part of what Jesus prophesied in Luke 4 when he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, right? To preach the gospel to the poor, etc. And he's quoting from Isaiah 61. The rest of that, which Jesus didn't mention in in Luke 4, but it goes on here to say, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they, now who's they? The people he's forming for his praise, that they may be called trees of righteousness. I want to declare to you that is the God's will for the city of Pomona in these times. He, this is the new thing. He's turning this city around and I declare to you this church has been appointed by God to be a catalyst for an outpouring of the Spirit in Pomona that will spill over to to other cities and towns in this region to bring forth trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Let's give the Lord praise his word. Now, with that in mind, I don't know if you have it on there, John 15, 16. Do you have that text up there? So I wanted to do a, maybe not. Okay. I was going to, you got it? Good. Because John chapter 15, that's back in Isaiah. John chapter 15, verse 16. There you go. What I like to do, I believe this is a little prophetic act for for us here in this church. I want us to read this, everybody to read this out loud because you're prophesying to yourself. What goes, here we go. You did not choose me, 
but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you these things I command you, that you love one another. That's Jesus talking to the church in Pomona, to New Life Pomona, who he is declared to be a body, a church made up of trees of righteousness. Amen? Amen. Can we give the Lord a big hand for his word? It's his word. It's his word. This is what's coming down the pipe. <clears throat> okay. Um, in this text in Isaiah 43, now we come to a little bit of bad news because he's spoken about a new thing that he's doing. It's already begun, but there's also an indictment against the church. And in verse 22, 43, 22, he says, But you have not called me, O Jacob. You've been weary of me, O Israel. You've not brought me the sheep for your burnt offerings, nor have you honored me with your sacrifice. And, the, and he goes on with a list of sacrificial things, which basically indicate that his people have turned away from him. They've stopped following him. They're worshiping something else. And so God has an indictment against them. But the good news for us here is, as he's talking about the law, we have Jesus who said in Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Okay? And this indictment goes on in verse 25. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Put me in remembrance. That's a key line right there. Put me in remembrance. Let us contend together. State your case that you may be acquitted. Your first father sinned. Your, medi your mediators have transgressed against me. Therefore, I will profane the princes of the sanctuary. I will give Jacob to the curse and Israel to reproaches. Today, the church, unfortunately, I have to announce to you, according to the Word of God, where we are at today, the church is under cur a curse and, a sh and shame. In the eyes of the world, the church is cursed and we've shamed ourselves. You say, how can you say that, Caleb? Let's go back here. This is what the Lord said to me. This verse 27, your first father sinned, that's Adam, your mediators Another word for mediators is interpreters. And God said, in these times in which we're living, the word of God has been so badly misinterpreted that we, the church, have become tolerant of things that the Bible, the word of God, says are abominations. That's where we are today. I don't like to preach this kind. Normally, I'm a good news kind of guy, you know, but here we are. So we've got to deal with it. But we have a word from God here as he's going to show us how to navigate our way through this crisis. Anybody up for some healthy navigation? Yeah. Praise God. Because he is the one who is able to make a way. And it's great because he doesn't ask us to do a whole lot. Because he's the ox, he's bearing the great burden. He says, I, even I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. Psalm 103 says, I've cast your transgressions as far as the east is from the west. This is Old Testament. This is God speaking in the past. It's already done. Mercy and forgiveness, it's already been accomplished from before the foundations of the world. This is why God is speaking from his 360 rear view mirror and telling us, you're already forgiven, but he wants us to do something. Here's the key. Put me in remembrance. Let us contend together. Put me in remembrance. Wherever you're at, put Jesus front and center. Put me in remembrance. Remembrance is, is, is a very, very important word. Remembrance for the Jews really kicked in strong in Exodus 15. 
Right after they, they came out of the Red Sea, you know the story, Miriam picked up the tambourine, they start rejoicing, and, and Moses gets a download of a song. It's printed in Exodus 15. And what he's doing is in that song, if you study the content of it, he's singing about who God is and what he's just done. And the remembrance of that deliverance event served as the backbone of worship throughout the entire Old Testament. It was remembered by the prophets, the psalmists, all the way up to Jesus at the Last Supper when he broke bread and said, do this in what? Amen. Remembrance of me. And he says, put me in remembrance. Let us contend together. State your case that you may be acquitted. God already knows they're going to be acquitted because he's already accomplished mercy and forgiveness. He, what does he want us to do? Remember me and then come talk to me. It's that simple. Remember me and come talk to me about your situation. Remember me, come talk to me about whatever kind of curse you think is on your life. Remember me, come talk to me about whatever shame you're engulfed with. Remember me, come talk to me about whatever it is that seems to be overwhelming to you. Remember me, come talk to me. Now, here's an amazing thing. This is what I love about God. See, because of his, his 360 degree view of things, he is able to turn on a dime from indictment, curse, to blessing. Watch this. He's just pointed out, Jacob, you're cursed. Israel, reproaches. Reproaches is shame, okay? In the next chapter, and it's really in the next verse because there's no chapter headings, you know, he says, yet here now, O Jacob, my servant. Wait a minute, I thought Jacob was cursed. Yet here now, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Wait a minute, I thought Israel was like shamed and full of reproaches. And this is where we come into <clears throat> God's desire regarding this new thing with the wineskins that he's forming us into. Thus says the Lord who made you and formed you from the womb who will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and you, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen, for I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring." The outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost was not just a one-time event because Jesus has not given up on building his church. So what, how does he do it? He calls, he chooses, and he fills. He calls, he chooses, and he fills. Some of you are here today, you may have been maybe your first time you've set foot in a church because of COVID-itis or whatever, and you've not really gotten it right with Jesus. I can tell you, you're not here by accident because God has been calling you. He's choosing you because he wants to fill you because he wants you to be a tree of righteousness that will influence this culture. Amen. If he can sneak up on me in a hotel room, he can do it with you. <laughs> You'll hear more about that next week. <laughs> but here's a word here, beautiful word here. God's not given up on his church. Jesus has not changed his mind about building his church. If you feel as though you have been living under a curse, Jesus calls you his servant. And as you start serving him, you will be set free. Some of you need to hear that. A lot of Christians say, well, I believe in Jesus, but my rear view mirror, I, I, and how I can, I'm not qualified to do anything. He calls you servant. And the way out is you start giving your life away. 
you start serving him and you'll be amazed at how quick you're going to be set free. Because he who the, he, <laughs> he who the son sets free is free indeed. You know, and he doesn't wait for us to start getting our act together and learn a bunch of Christianese and, you know, the, no, 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 no. Once you say yes to him, it's irreversible. It's absolutely irreversible. Once you say yes to him, it's irreversible. He comes in and he starts doing what only he can do. Changes your mind, changes your heart. It's just wonderful. <clears throat> and also, if you feel, you may be here today, you feel like your life has been held captive by a sense of overwhelming shame with the accompanying threat of rejection or abandonment, Jesus says, I have chosen you to be one of mine. I've chosen, oh, that went quiet. That's okay. If you've been held captive by a sense of overwhelming shame with the accompanying threat of rejection or abandonment, Jesus says, I've chosen you to be one of mine. Because Jesus has this promise that he never gives up on. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I can honestly testify that in 38 years of serving Jesus, he has never left me nor forsaken me. I've failed him. In some kind of thought, word, or deed, I have failed him. He has never backed off from me once, never left me nor forsaken me. And he's great at setting up my repentance. Oh, yeah. He loves us so much, he sets us up to say yes to him. That went quiet. Okay. This is good. Okay, we're going to take a little detour here. I can't believe I'm doing, doing good here. Yeah. So how do, we respond, how do we respond to crisis? What model do we have, in the old, at least in the Bible, to respond to crisis? The one that came up to me is Moses. Moses, uh, Numbers, chapter 14, 11. Let me give you the context here. This is... An, uh, this is a doozy of a crisis. They've been sent to the promised land. They're on the borders of the promised land. They've sent the, sent the 12 spies in there. Okay, they come back. Ten of them come back with a horrendous report. They're defying God. Caleb and Joshua, they lose their minds. They say, no, we can take this. So here's a problem. This is Houston. We have a problem on steroids right here. Because God has led them to the promised land, right? And they don't want to go in. So Moses has to go talk to God and justify their obstinance, right? They've thrown Moses under the bus. Because if you remember at Mount Sinai, when, when, when God came down to Mount Sinai, fried the top of the mountain, they all went, oh, no, we're not talking to him. You go talk to him and then we'll just do what you say. That was the deal. So here we are. And there's this amazing conversation. There's this amazing prayer. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'll pick it up from number, uh, verse 11, Numbers 14, 11. How long will these people reject me? How long will they not believe me? With all the signs which I have performed among them, I will strike them with the pestilence and disherit, disinherit them. And I will make you a nation greater and mightier than they. Now, Moses does a funny thing. <laughs> He's trying to negotiate with God, trying to appeal to his ego. And basically, he's saying, well, what are, what are, what are they going to think? What are they going to think? Then the Egyptians will hear it, for by your might you brought these people up from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. Then they have heard that you, Lord, are among these people. And Moses is not getting it. God is not concerned what people think about him. He's very complete in who he is. He doesn't have a self-esteem problem. He doesn't have an identity crisis, okay? His administration of his creation is rock solid. It's tight. He knows exactly what's going on. 
So, but what he's doing, he's just let Moses come to the end of his rope until Moses finally kicks in to the things that God really wants to hear and the things that God will then choose to act upon. And it's really great. <laughs> and he says, because the Lord was not able to bring this people to the land which he swore to give them, therefore he killed them in the wilderness. Then here's, here's where he changes. And now I pray, let the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken. Hold it. The prayer's just changed. He's kicked into what I call the you said prayer. Intercessors take note. The you said prayer. He's not praying out of his fears or his emotions or anything like that. He's switched gears now. He said, and now I pray, let the power of my Lord be great, just as you've spoken, saying, the Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he by no means clears the guilty, visiting... Does that sound familiar? Does that sound familiar? Because what Moses is doing, he's remembering, remembrance again, a previous crisis, which was maybe a bit worse than the current crisis. And that crisis was, you find in Exodus 34, 7, is when he's gone up to get the Ten Commandments. He comes down with the Ten Commandments. And all the people have lost their minds. Even his brothers lost their mind. And they're all having an orgy worshiping the golden calf. He smashes the Ten Commandments. He goes back up to the mountain to meet with God again. And that's where he asks God, show me your glory. Remember that whole section? Show me your glory. God says, I can't do that. You're fry. No man can see my face and live. I'm going to hide you in the cleft of a rock. And I'm going to make all my goodness pass before me. That's where God revealed his character. And this is what, in the midst of a crisis, Moses now remembers. And he's saying, Lord, you said, this is what you said, that your long-suffering, abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression... But he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Pardon the iniquity of this people. Now he's making a request based upon what God has said. Pardon this people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. And this I love. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned. Wait a minute, past tense. Isn't that great? As soon as you get into the you said prayer, God says it's done. Did you hear that? As soon as you get into the you said kind of prayer, God immediately says it's done. And listen to this on what basis? Remember that word ownership I said at the beginning? Remembrance, ownership. And this is God. I have pardoned according to your word. Wait a minute. Moses didn't have a word. Moses did not have a word. Moses was bent out of shape. He's trying to appeal. He's trying to save the day, you know, because these people have thrown him under the bus. He didn't have a word. What happens is when we take ownership of the word of God, God says, that's your word. Now we can, now we've got some partnership going on here. Now we got, but now we can, now I can roll up my sleeves and get to work. That's how it works. God said to Moses, I have pardoned according to your word. I love that. But, as, but truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Moses didn't have a word. God's speaking in the past tense. Moses remembers a previous crisis and what God had revealed and spoke back then and hands that back to God. Moses took ownership of the word of God and entered into partnership with God, thus enabling him to move forward in the purposes of God. How many of you say, I want to, be, I want to move forward in the purposes of God in my life? How many hands we got there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
How do you do it? Take ownership of the Word. Take ownership of the Word. Take ownership of the Word. In the book of Acts, it says, regarding the, the witness and the ministry that the early church had, <laughs> they said, they went everywhere preaching in the Word, and signs and wonders followed confirming the Word. Which came first, the signs and wonders or the Word? Well, that's about three of us over here got it. Let's see where we're doing. The Word. The Word. Yeah, the Word. Don't get me wrong. I'm all for signs and wonders. I could tell you all kind of stories over the years of miracles and stuff I've seen. But one thing God told me years ago, don't go chasing signs and wonders. Get into my Word. And that's how I've lived. That's how I live. It's the Word. It's the Word that changes us. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. So a lot of people say, well, I just don't have that kind of faith. It could be that you're not getting enough Word in there. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word. Yeah. Well, I read my Bible, but I just don't seem to get anything out of it. Then ask God on the basis of that verse in Romans... Ask him to open your ears so that you can hear. Because whatever he's got to say is going to be, he, he will back up his word. He don't fail. I'm going to close with this. Second Peter, chapter 1, verse 4. He talks about being partakers of the divine nature. And from this we know what the spiritual diet, if you like, was of the early church that changed the world. And he says, by which, and he's talking, to the, talking about the divine power of God, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. They were living in a time of incredible crisis of corruption under the Emperor Nero and all the madness of Rome. How did they do it? They lived, they took ownership of the promises of God that were written in times of corruption and crisis. That's where we are today. Does that make sense to you? Does that make sense to you? The promises of God. They were written in Christ. They were written in times of crisis. You may be here today and you say, you know what? I want to be a partaker of this. I've never, I've never really given my life over to Jesus. And I want to invite you to do that. 38 years ago, I said yes to Jesus. Can I tell you? that the most important yes a human being can say is to say yes to God, is to say yes to the only one that can really change your life and continue to change your life. Continue to change. My life verse is 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, <clears throat> the old things passed away, all things become new. You know how that plays out in the Greek, it's continuous. It reads, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, literally a new genesis, and the old things continually pass away, and all things are continually becoming new. That's how it reads. That's how it reads. How does that happen once you say yes? To the degree that I'm in the Word, to the degree that I'm in the Word, the rear view mirror continually disappears. To the degree I'm in the Word, God's 360 degree mirror becomes more and more clear. This is the kingdom life. This is the kingdom life. I'm going to ask you, let's all bow our heads. I think there's some decisions here. 
I think there's some decisions to, to be made. You're not here by accident. Some of you have been going, you know, through the hoops with all kinds of stuff. And it's time for you to land your feet on solid ground. And the way you do that is say yes to the one who died for you on Calvary's cross. Yes to the one who made mercy and forgiveness available to you. It's all done. Yes to the one who can give you value and significance to your life. You're in God's sight. You're not a victim. You're not an accident. You're not a product of your environment. In his mind, he wants to make you brand new and fit you in to his original intentions for mankind. He wants to, and he is able to, if you are willing, to give you an extreme makeover. An extreme makeover. If you're here today and you say, Caleb, I want your prayer. I want you to pray for me. I want to say yes to Jesus. Could you please, at the count of three, just put your hand up in the air right now. One, two, three. God bless you. Keep them up there. If you mean business, keep them up there. His hands all over the place. God bless you. God bless you. I see you. As I said before, where two or more are agreed as touching anything on earth, it is done by my Father in heaven. So, Father, I thank you for these hands that you see raised right now. New wineskins are being formed right now. I thank you that their yes has been received into your heart and your mind, and you are so willing and able to start your transform, transforming work right now. I'm going to ask you to say this prayer with me out loud. Lord Jesus Christ... Thank you for dying for me, for rising for me, and that you ever live for me, naming me before the Father in heaven. So today I say yes to who you are, the Son of God, my Savior, my Lord, my Healer, my Redeemer, and I thank you that today is the day of my salvation, no turning back. I choose this day to take ownership of your name, and I ask that you fill me with your Holy Spirit and give me the power to live for you and have understanding of your word. In Jesus' name, Everybody said amen and amen. Let me hand you back to your pastor. Let's all stand. We need to be able to see like Caleb sees. When he looks in the rearview mirror, he doesn't see his old junk anymore. He sees the son that God sees him to be. I need to keep working on that one because Satan keeps making me look the wrong way and we need to stop it, amen? My encouragement next week, uh, I'm going to talk about how to vote. Legally, I can't tell you who to vote for, but I'm going to tell you how to vote. And I'm going to take you to Scripture and I'm going to take you right to God's Word, right? This is why it's so important, God's Word. And I'm going to give you Scripture after Scripture. Some of us say, but I voted one way my whole life. I've been a Republican, a Democrat, an Independent. I would tell you that I don't care what you've been your whole life. We need to literally see everything through God's Word. You laid it out. You, you kind of prep for my sermon next week. God's Word lasts forever. I used to be with a lot of things that I found out weren't so good. Any of you guys? <laughs> I just have. And he's so kind. And so next Sunday, we're going to do that the following week. Um, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You guys, bring your friends. Wednesday night, Caleb's going to share his story. For those that maybe didn't know, he was lead guitarist uh, for Elton John for years. God saved his, his conversion story. He's going to share. It's nuts. If you have friends that wouldn't normally come to church but they'll come listen to a crazy rock and roller story. You need to bring him on Wednesday night because he's going to share a story. It's crazy. 
I read his book. It's crazier than I even knew. I knew you were crazy, bro, but wow. So bring your friends because some will go, I want to listen to that. Probably not to me, all right? God bless you. On Thursday night, Caleb Brown is going to share, and we're going to watch people heal. Each night, we're going to do all of it, but we're emphasizing. Thursday night, Caleb Brown has been to 40 nations in the last few years. Thousands of documented miracles. Thousands, literally. God's going to heal, literally. He's going to heal this morning. If you need healing this morning, Jesus heals now. Amen? We don't have to wait. Well, I'll come that Thursday night, and I hope God... No, we pray this morning because Jesus is the healer. Amen? But bring some of your friends that you know need a miracle and healing on Thursday night. And Friday night, Jane and I are going to talk about freedom. Freedom. How many of you guys know somebody that needs to get free? How many of you guys know it's you? Keep your hand up. Don't lie. A few of you went, no, it's not me, Pastor. I promise you, every one of us needs to get free in an area. I don't care who you are. Even Caleb Quay needs to get free in an area of life still. Just saying. So I'm going to ask our prayer team to come. If you need prayer this morning, please come and get prayer. Jesus, we love you. Father, I speak a blessing over every person here. I pray over our families. I pray over our lives. I pray over our families, our businesses, Lord. I pray over this nation. Lord, I pray your kingdom come, your will be done. Lord, I release goodness, kindness, and favor over every one of us, God. I pray this week there would be supernatural moves that we would hear the praise reports that God stepped into something that would have been impossible, but somehow God did it. So Jesus, you open the heavens over all of us. I pray faith as we go today in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much for all the blessings. Get your ice cream on the way out. There's ice cream for you guys. If you need prayer, please come right here and we're going to pray for you guys. God bless you. Hi. Hi.